cook for 12 minutes. Let's write a pizza timer for the Commodore Amiga. Writing a GUI application in C for the Commodore Amiga requires learning how the operating system handles user interface stuff. Let's start by figuring out what we want to build, then determine what we need to learn. We'll need a window, then a bunch of components we interact with. The timer needs to handle accepting our countdown time, starting and stopping the timer, and changing the display with every second that ticks down. It also needs to alert us when the timer hits zero. Oh, and an about window would be nice too. Very likely, if it's a GUI app running on an Amiga, it's written using Intuition. Intuition is the framework responsible for rendering workbench windows and apps, and pretty much everything that's not totally 100% custom GUI code. Intuition uses the custom chip Agnes' bit blitter to quickly render screen and window contents, rather than having the CPU draw things. Now, this isn't a live coding video. The timer's already written, and the source code is linked to in the description. Grab the code and follow along. This also isn't a general tutorial on the C programming language. You'll likely pick up a lot just by looking over the code, but if you're really new to C, I've linked to some tutorials that should get you up to speed. Let's start by opening our pizza timer window. Windows can be defined in a few ways in Intuition. I've chosen to use the tag-based method, as using default values for part of the window's definition is easier with tags than with structs. Tags also feel like keyword arguments from more modern programming languages. This window will render most of the usual window components, called gadgets in Intuition, and will listen for various user interactions. More on those interactions later. With just a little bit of housekeeping around this code, we can open our empty window, keep it on screen for a few seconds, and then close it. Neat, right? Now, we need to put some things into the window. For that, we'll use the GAD Tools library, a GUI helper library available in Amiga OS 2 and higher. While it's not the most modern Amiga GUI framework, it's straightforward to use, there's a lot of example code, and you don't have to install anything else to use it. We'll also skip using any external helper libraries for GAD tools. Let's keep this first version nice and simple. When you're building a graphical user interface, you have to determine the positions of the components in the interface. There's a lot of different approaches to laying out components in an interface, some more automatic than others. And it would be great if we had access to those, wouldn't it be? In GAD tools, every component, or gadget, is absolutely positioned from the top left corner of the window. Its position, width, and height are defined at the time you create the gadget. There's a decent amount of math needed to make things responsive to window resizes, so we're going to make our window not resizable. Again, keeping it simple. So we type up this huge list of gadgets. We modify this new gadget struct over and over to set things like position, unique identifier, and font attributes. Then, we call create gadget to instantiate a new GadTools gadget, combining the new gadget struct with tags that define additional gadget properties. We then take this list of gadgets, add them to the window, call refresh glist to help the gadgets settle into their new window home, and then call gt refresh window to give all the gadgets a final kick into existence. However, we're not ready to render these gadgets just yet. We have to do a bit of housekeeping first. You may have noticed references to visual info in the code. Visual info is, well, it's a secret to everybody. It's some data about the screen that GadTools uses to get gadgets all dressed up nice for their debut in your application. Let's create a setup function. We'll add the visual info retrieval here to start. We'll put other setup code here eventually too. We might as well lock the workbench screen while we're at it so that it doesn't go away while we're running our pizza timer. Finally, we'll reverse these steps in a teardown function. Teardown is here to make sure we free all of the resources we allocate. Otherwise, we'll be leaking RAM in the system and that's not polite. For this timer, we're going to use the greatest Amiga font ever, Topaz. We'll need two copies of the font. First, the default 8 pixel version of the font that the rest of the Workbench UI uses. Then, for the timer itself, we want a BIG TOPAZ. We get these fonts in two different ways. The 8 pixel version is in Kickstart ROM, so we can just, like, use it. But we should still verify it exists, so let's do just that. For the 16 pixel tall version, we'll use diskfont.library to generate a larger version for our timer. Of course, we have to free those fonts when we're done with them too. Let's go over the timer logic. Remember, it's best to follow along with the complete source code so you can see everything in context. We're storing the time the user set in integers, one each for hour, minute, and second. We have a boolean to keep track of the running state of the timer. When the user pushes the button to start the timer, we capture the current system time. The user can pause the timer with the same button and reset the pause timer to its original time with a different button. 
Every so often, we'll subtract our captured system time from the current system time to see how many microseconds have elapsed. We'll do the math to convert that to the remaining hours, minutes, and seconds in our timer, and turn that remaining time into a ready-to-display string using sprintf. When the timer hits zero, we'll flash the screen and play a sound to let us know the pizza's ready. Now, to make all of this work, we'll need to learn a bunch more about the Amiga, so let's keep going! Oh, right. There's a couple of great ways to find documentation and example code. I personally prefer example code over docs, but both are really important. In the description, I'll link to the Amiga documentation sites I usually end up using. If there's an obscure function, struct, or keyword you're trying to look up, and regular search engines aren't cutting it, searching large code repository sites directly on that keyword can sometimes work. Finally, there's a bunch of forums with developers who have much more experience than I do with Amiga development that have a lot of advice to offer. Now, we've got all these gadgets, but they don't really do anything. Well, not anything we're paying attention to. These sliders are screaming away while we drag them around, and we've got our metaphorical earplugs in. Uh, pardon me. We need to listen for those slider changes on what Amiga OS calls message ports. Message ports are a mailbox your application can open. Once one is created and the address is passed out to other pieces of interested code, that other code can create messages and place them in your mailbox with interesting data. Once you receive the message, you reply to it to let the sender know you're done with it. You can even send back more data if you want. Unreplied messages could cause memory leaks. Letting the sender know you're done with the message gives them a chance to free the message's memory. When you open a window in Intuition, you automatically get a message port you can receive messages on. Those types of messages are Intuition Direct Communication Message Port Messages, abbreviated IDCMP. If you look at our open window call from earlier, you see a list of IDCMP flags being logically ORed together. These list the types of IDCMP messages we want Intuition to send to us. In our case, we want to know if the window needs to be redrawn, if the close button was clicked, if someone picked a menu item, and if certain GadTools gadgets were interacted with. While we wait for some UI interaction to happen, it's best for us to not do anything too active. To be perfectly still. To simply wait. To do otherwise would rudely steal CPU time from other processes, and we're not rude here at the Industrious Rabbit. We tell Amiga OS that we're waiting, and under what conditions we want to be disturbed. This uses a mechanism called signals, which I, I'm not going to cover in this video, okay? All you need to know is that you need to OR together all the MP sig bits from all the message ports you want to wait on. Then you just let Amiga OS do its thing. Nothing more about signals in this video, got it? Let's use these messages to make it possible to close our window by clicking the close button. First, we need an event wait loop. We loop infinitely until we've been terminated. Then we wait to get a message from intuition about events we care about. Received messages are queued up as they come in, and GT get I message will pull the earliest message from the top of the queue. This means that there may be more than one message waiting for us, and we should handle as many queued messages as we can before moving on. Now that we have our message, we can see what class of message it is. If the message class is a closed window class, we set the global terminated state to true, which causes us to exit the event loop. This is also the place where we can hook up the sliders to change the hours, minutes, and seconds of the timer. Gadgets have unique numeric identifiers we can use to figure out which gadget triggered the event. I used constant integers for the identifiers to make the code easier to read. This is also a good place to try printing debugging output. Here, I'll use good old printf to print the current timer to the command line output whenever the sliders change. Finally, we get the buttons to react. Clicking the start stop button or the reset button will call their own function. The start stop button will toggle the timer. If the timer is now on, some timer logic stuff will happen. If it's off, we'll set the sliders to the values of the currently displayed timer value. Now that we're starting and stopping our timer, we start to care about time itself. Time. That ever advancing, relentless force that drives us all towards the void. Let's get the Amiga to measure it for us. In Amiga OS, you do timer related stuff with timer.device. We're going to be doing two things with it. First, we'll get the current number of microseconds that have elapsed since the computer was turned on. Then, we'll tell timer.device to send us a message to a message port when a certain amount of time has passed. We're going to become message port pros when we're done with this code. To work with timer.device, we'll need to create a message port. Then create an IO request to hand it a timer. IO requests are like IDCMP messages, but for devices. 
Now that we have our IO request handy, we can open a connection to the timer and request our current time using get sys time. We can also tell timer.device to message us sometime in the future, kinda like a pizza timer. To get timer.device to message us on our port, we have to send an IO request. We have two ways we can do this. Sometimes you wanna wait for an IO request to be done before you do something else. This is synchronous IO, and you do that on the Amiga by calling do IO. In our case, we want the user to be able to stop the timer with the button or even close the app, even if we made a request to the timer to message us later. For this, we want our timer request to be asynchronous, so we can do other stuff. We call send IO to do just that. We can build a function which will tell the timer to message us on our message port a fraction of a second later. We call this once we've toggled the timer on. Since we have a timer message port, and since message ports are things we can wait on, we can add the timer signal to the list of signals we want Amiga OS to notify us on. Nope, still not covering signals. When it's the timer that wakes us up, we'll handle the countdown timer logic and then re-render the user interface. We'll do some time math to get the difference between the current system time and the one we captured at the start. If the timer hit zero, we'll end the timer and notify the user. Otherwise, we'll change the display on the timer and ask the timer device to wake us up again in another fraction of a second. Updating the timer display involves creating a new formatted character string, then updating the text gadget to use the new string. We keep track of what the display was set to the last time we called this function, so we don't redraw the text gadget over and over, which can cause flickering. Since Send.io is asynchronous, it's possible that the user can close the app before timer.device messages us back. If the timer tries to message us after the app goes away, it can crash the Amiga. We need to check to make sure there is no outstanding timer IO. If there is, we have to wait for it to complete. Once the timer hits zero, we need to alert the user that it's finished. We'll do this in two ways. First, using the display beep function. This flashes the screen. This is the Amiga alternative to a PC speaker beep since Amigas don't come with speakers built in. But if you do have speakers, we can have Paula play a sound through them along with the flash. Along the same lines of keeping this simple, we're going to use the built-in data type system to load a sound file and have Paula play it. Data types is a file format agnostic way of dealing with picture, sound, video, and text data on the Amiga. If there's a data type for parsing a file format, you can get it the decoded data within. For us, we're going to load an IFF 8SVX file into memory for Paula. 8SVX is a typically uncompressed 8-bit sample data format, kind of like a WAV file. We have this bell noise, Thanks, CDRK on freesound.org. And we'll use Audacity and Socks on my Linux machine to trim the sound and convert it to 8SVX format. Now we need to use the data types library to load the sound from disk and start it playing. If you notice, we're handing this data types function a signal we allocated and... All right, all right, I'll talk about signals. Imagine your bedroom has a bunch of holes in the wall. While you're taking a nap, someone pokes you with a stick from the outside through one of the holes. Now, not only are you awake, you know which hole you were poked through. That's how signals work. You can hand the data types library a signal you want to be poked through once Paula is done playing the sound, so that you can free the memory the sound was using. You don't want to do that while Paula is playing the sound, otherwise it'll just stop playing suddenly. That's rude, and we're not rude here. Speaking of freeing the memory, here's what that looks like. A wait and a disposed DT object and the sound is gone. Finally, we have to add some code to set up and tear down the data types library and our custom signal. Phew, we're almost there. Just two more small things to add, a menu and an about window. Intuition menus are those classic hold right mouse button down top of screen menus. And with GAD tools, they're really easy to create. We'll create an array of new new menu structs and we'll also create our own menu data struct too. The reason for this extra menu data struct stuff is to make it easier to figure out which menu the user selected. Otherwise, we have to loop through every possible menu item and identify by its position in the menu which one was selected. With menu data, we're being much more explicit. We build the menu and attach it to our app window, and then tear it down when we're done with it. You get the idea by now. Finally, we have to listen for menu pick events in our IDCMP message processing. We have to unpack that menu data struct we attached to the menu item in question, and then look at the ID in that struct to figure out what to do. We can see the finish line. It's the about window. The about window is just a smaller version of everything we've done so far. We'll open a separate window, populate it with gadgets, and implement an event loop just for that window. We're only listening for close events on the window, and we're not listening in on events on the main window. Though they'll be waiting there for us once we finish with the about window. If you want an example that walks through the entire window lifecycle, the about window's got you covered. Whew, that was quite a ride. 
Our pizza timer works great and we learned a lot about the Amiga in the process. But it's not over just yet. We did a lot of allocating and freeing things and, well, it's super easy to miss freeing something in a language without a garbage collector. There's a lot of tools out there for analyzing your program as it's running to detect if you've freed everything you've requested or closed every library or device. For checking Pizza Timer, I used Code Watcher, which executes your code and then shows you a very detailed list of what resources you used and what's left over when your code exits. You can also run the built-in avail command before and after you run your program to make sure your memory usage is the same, which it should be. So there you have it, a fully functional and memory leak tested pizza timer written using only built-in Amiga OS functionality in C, and we learned a ton about how GUIs work on the Amiga, along with detours into devices, signals, and data types. Pretty awesome, right? Now I'm gonna get my pizza out of the oven. Oh, well, that's unfortunate, but there's a note for you on this pizza. That's weird, right?